Hello, welcome to this series of lessons on the only case study in the entire AS level psychology syllabus. This case study is a super interesting one. Um, it's also unique because it's the only study that gives you exposure into how the case method is used in psychology. Um, it also is an example of a longitudinal study design. It was done in 2002. It lasted about a year and a half, approximately, although the original study doesn't give us the exact time. In this lesson, I'll give you a quick overview of what the study was all about, as well as the key terms that were used in the study and that you'll encounter in subsequent lessons about Saavedra and Silverman's button phobia case. So, this study is situated in the learning approach within psychology. If you recall, the learning approach has two key theories, or well, three key theories. Um, the ones that we'll talk about today are classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So when we're talking about classical conditioning, we are referring to how we learn certain responses based on the associations between different stimuli. Stimuli are elements in the external environment that will um, evoke some kind of response from you. So it's about stimulus response. And the baseline assumption of classical conditioning is that any previously unconditioned stimulus when combined with a neutral stimulus can produce a conditioned response. In simple words, it's when you take an unconditioned stimulus, for example, like food, where when you see food, you start feeling hungry and you combine that with a neutral stimulus like a bell. And when that association between the two becomes strong, at some point, the neutral stimulus will become a conditioned stimulus and just hearing a bell will make you hungry, which then becomes your conditioned response. And then you have <coughs> operant conditioning. And when we're talking about operant conditioning, it's also focused on stimulus response. However, the stimulus response is determined by the consequences of the response, meaning if a particular response produces positive consequences, that's positive reinforcement, meaning it reinforces your behavior and it makes it more likely that you will act in certain ways because you want that positive reinforcement or that reward. And on the flip side, you will avoid certain behaviors because they will either produce a punishment, a negative consequence, or a different type of negative consequence called negative reinforcement where when you uh, undertake a particular behavior it will result in the removal of something you desire or the removal of something you want which is called negative reinforcement. So these two core theories in the learning approach are part of this particular case study. We'll talk more about this as we get into the details of the case but remember that a case study is a very focused and detailed examination of a small unit. So that unit can either be one person or a small group of people. And obviously in this study, as you can see, the unit in question was a nine-year-old boy. As I mentioned earlier, this was a longitudinal study, which means that it went on for a period of time. However, there is a different type of case study method as well, which is called a cross-sectional method where you examine a phenomena just at a point in time, but you do it in great detail and you zero in on a small unit when you're doing that examination. They, uh, Savidra and Silmavan used self-reports to collect information about this nine-year-old boy who presented with a phobia. Now, his phobia is very unique. It's very, very unique because he was scared of buttons. And before I talk more about the button phobia itself, a phobia is defined as an irrational and extreme fear. So it's not the same sort of fear you experience, let's say when you're watching a horror movie and you jump out of your seat when the, when the you know, villain or the ghost pops out of nowhere. It's a phobia, uh, when it's a phobia, it's an irrational fear, meaning that it controls all of your behaviors um, in ways that make you maladaptive. 
And so this specific button phobia, this irrational, extreme, unfounded fear of buttons is what was being experienced by the nine-year-old boy who was studied in this case method. And Saavedra and Silverman focused their case on one piece of classical conditioning, which is called evaluative learning. So now if you recall, I had mentioned that when we're talking about classical conditioning, we're talking about stimulus response where you have an unconditioned stimulus paired with a neutral stimulus. And then once the neutral stimulus um, starts to become closely associated with the unconditioned stimulus, the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus because it starts to produce the same response that previously the unconditioned stimulus would produce. Now, um, evaluative learning is one way to look at classical conditioning because when we talk about evaluating something, it's essentially when we are assessing something. So the evaluative learning perspective in classical conditioning states that when we are associating so between the neutral uh, stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, we evaluate that neutral stimulus. We evaluate that neutral stimulus and evaluating that neutral stimulus when it gives us a negative evaluation, meaning that our perception of that previously neutral stimulus becomes negative, that is what will cause a particular sort of response. Of course, you can also positively evaluate, but this is different from the other approach to classical conditioning, which is called expectancy learning. And what I explained uh, earlier as the basic um, fundamental of classical conditioning, where you have pairing of an unconditioned and neutral stimulus, and that paired association produces a conditioned response, that is very much focused on expectancy learning because in expectancy learning, you begin to expect that particular response from that neutral stimulus. But in evaluative learning, you will begin to expect, you will evaluate, sorry, you will evaluate the neutral stimulus negatively and you will hence start to think of it in terms of negative emotions. You will associate negative emotions with it based on your assessment of it. So that previously neutral and non-threatening object becomes a threatening object based on your assessment or your evaluation of it. It's not about the expectation of a threat, which is what would happen when we're talking about expectancy learning. It is right here and it's more about how you um, evaluate something and then you negatively evaluate it and it's not about what you expect from it it's simply that you associate that particular stimulus with a negative connotation so Saavedra and Silverman saw that this button phobia in this child, such a unique phobia exists, and they wanted to figure out what would work to treat it. And based on their concept of evaluative learning, they were very interested in seeing how this previously non-threatening neutral stimulus of buttons, this fear of buttons that developed based on the negative evaluation of the buttons, could be treated using imagery exposure therapy, which is exposure to uh, a threatening or um, yeah, threatening stimulus, which comes from simply imagining yourself in situations where you are confronted by that threatening stimulus. And so they figured that focusing on fear is not enough. So they started to look at the relationship between fear, and remember, phobia is an irrational fear, right? They started to look at the relationship between fear and disgust, and there was some prior uh, research that informed this direction. However, they figured that the, evaluate, the evaluation of that stimulus of buttons resulted in this feeling of disgust and then that disgust becomes overblown to become extreme fear also known as you guessed it phobia so like i said super interesting case uh, very unique i have not seen anything about buttons um, since then 
But now let's just look at the key terms so that we can remember them and keep them in mind as we proceed through our lessons on this case. So as I mentioned, a phobia is a persistent, excessive and irrational fear. So now let's look at the key terms in this lesson so that you can keep them in mind as you go through the next few lessons on this case study as well. The first one is phobia and as I had mentioned earlier, phobia is an excessive and irrational fear. It's also a persistent fear. It's not one that will just go away and the fear is so immobilizing, it's so excessive that it impacts your day-to-day -day life to very extreme levels. So for example, in our case study on button phobia, the little boy was experiencing difficulty in simply wearing clothing that had buttons. He would have problems interacting with people who were wearing clothes that had buttons. And you can imagine that this was obviously a maladaptive uh, situation where he couldn't be functional because of this excessive, irrational, persistent fear. So next up, you have classical conditioning. When we're talking about classical conditioning, as we just talked about earlier, we're talking about how an unconditioned stimulus, when it's paired with a neutral stimulus, where neutral means something that doesn't evoke any kind of specific response, so when you pair an unconditioned stimulus with this neutral stimulus, you will eventually create what is called a conditioned response. So a simple way for you to remember this, um, it looks a little math-like, but it's, I think, a quick hack if you want to, you know, if you get confused in all these big, big words. So just remember, an unconditioned stimulus plus a neutral stimulus and remember that the unconditioned stimulus right now has an unconditioned response, right? And what we want is for this neutral stimulus to produce that same response. So when we pair the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus, the neutral stimulus will eventually become... Oops. The neutral stimulus will eventually become a conditioned stimulus that conditioned stimulus will now produce a conditioned response and that conditioned response right here is the exact same as the unconditioned response so that is how we learn certain behaviors simply based on the associations we form between different types of stimuli the next piece of the classical conditioning puzzle is called evaluative learning Evaluative learning is also something that Savidra and Silverman were focusing on, whereby when we look at any kind of neutral stimulus, we evaluate or assess it. And in our evaluation or assessment, we may form a negative association with that neutral stimulus and a particular emotion, obviously a negative emotion, for Savidra and Silverman, the emotion in question was disgust because as you remember, I just talked about that relationship between fear and disgust and based on that negative evaluation, that neutral stimulus because of the evaluation becomes associated with that negative emotion. Hence, the behavioral response becomes controlled by that negative emotion that comes from the negative evaluation. So in the case of a phobia, um, to put it very simply, this little boy looks at buttons and he evaluates them negatively and they produce, a, in Savedra and Silverman's um, conceptualization, they produce a feeling of disgust. Then that association between disgust and buttons, so buttons evaluated produces disgust and then the intensity of that disgust eventually results in a phobia. And that phobia creates avoidance behaviors. So this is what they were trying to examine in their case study. Imagery exposure is a type of treatment therapy and this was what was used by Savedra and Silverman where you ask a patient or a client who's in therapy to imagine the thing they fear, the thing that is causing this extreme reaction, the thing that they have this persistent, excessive, irrational fear of. And based on those imaginations, that's the 
they're not actual images. We literally ask the person to imagine this. So based on that imagery, over time, as exposure increases, it's supposed to decrease the intensity of the fear response of the phobia response. And then lastly, you have the DSM-4, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. <clears throat> the DSM-4 is a handbook. It is a checklist. It actually covers every single known mental illness or mental disorder. Uh, it is published by the American Psychiatric Association and it is used by clinical psychologists all over the world to identify and diagnose what is happening to certain people when they go in for treatment. So it's used to diagnose psychological disorders, personality disorders, mood disorders. At the time this study was published in 2002, the fourth edition was used of the DSM, hence it's called the DSM-4. Just for your information, um, the current manual is called the DSM-5, which has been updated. So every decade or so, the DSM goes through a review process and it was first published in the 1950s. So now we're using the fifth version of it. Um, and they update it to cover new sort of mental disorders that may have come up or to reclassify uh, pre-existing conditions. So it's just a checklist of different symptoms and it explains the conditions at which you can actually make a diagnosis. If you do take clinical psychology in your A2 year, you will learn more about the DSM. Um, so these are some of the key terms that you should keep in mind as we move through this case study. So next up, we're going to start looking in greater detail at the psychology that's being investigated by Savitra and Silverman in this case.